Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, now, before we begin portfolio questions, I would advise the Chamber that I have accepted a request under Rule 13.2.2 for an urgent ministerial statement to be made on the novel coronavirus COVID-19 this afternoon. The statement will be made at around 4.45 and decision time will therefore be moved to 5.15. I should also add that the statement will be uh, British Sign Language signed uh, for our audience. So moving on to portfolio questions. Transport, infrastructure and connectivity. First question from Michel Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what meetings it has held with stakeholders regarding the potential impact on public transport of the coronavirus COVID-19. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Sign officer, we have well established links and protocols for these situations and have been sharing guidance and advice from colleagues at Health Protection Scotland with their key stakeholders. Transport Scotland officials are in regular contact with transport operators such as ScotRail, bus operators, CalMac and Traffic Scotland. They're also in regular contact with Scottish ports and airports to ensure that they receive consistent guidance and marketing material with uh, the Health Protection Scotland message. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Minister will, will be aware that people who live in isolated communities often rely on public transport. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me if he has had any conversations regarding the provision of replacement drivers to ensure the continuation of these crucial services if we have a shortage of drivers on trains and buses? The Secretary. Officer, obviously the approach that we are taking is one which is based upon the clinical and scientific advice that's been provided through uh, uh, the Chief Medical Officer and Health Protection Scotland clinicians and that information is updated on a regular basis uh, for our transport operators. What I can say to the member is that we have asked uh, operators to consider their uh, continuity planning arrangements, the contingency planning arrangements that they have in place uh, for dealing with any major instance and that they are undertaking reviews to ensure uh, that they have appropriate measures in place and what we will do is we will continue to provide them with the necessary information uh, around the actions that they should be taking as uh, operators as we go forward with what is a very dynamic uh, situation with uh, COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. Uh, so I can assure the member that we continue to engage with uh, transport operators uh, and will provide them with the most up-to-date information as we go forward and to ensure that they are putting in place the appropriate contingency plans that they may require. Thank you. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Colin Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned uh, the issue of uh, being in touch with the port operators uh, and, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, uh, the issue of cruise liners is uh, a growing uh, aspect of tourism and marine tourism across Scotland. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide some further information regarding the information that's been provided to the port operators to ensure that when the cruise ships do come in and also the uh, tourists do come off the cruise ships that uh, all safety measures can be taken? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Government, of course, the uh, Officer recognises the importance of the tourism sector, particularly the growing market that we have in uh, cruise line operators uh, using Scottish uh, ports in relation to any specific vessel, uh, including what would be a, a cruise ship, if it's intended to dock or to uh, dock at a port in Scotland, we have a, an established protocol that allows the existing uh, arrangements through the uh, Territorial Health Board for that area, along with the local authority who are responsible for delivering health, port health matters, uh, to effectively take forward measures as they see appropriate on the basis of the vessel um, entering dock or uh, looking to disembark uh, within a Scottish port. Uh, the Scottish port sector has a well-rehearsed procedure in dealing with these types of issues when it comes to health-related matters, and I can assure the member that information and guidance is provided uh, via our health boards and local authorities for how port health matters should be taken forward in relation to coronavirus and to manage any incidents that may occur. Colin Smith to be followed by Gail Ross. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, one of the target areas that, that our real franchise holders often uh, fail to deliver on relate to those uh, regarding station and train cleanliness. So will the Cabinet Secretary work with the rail operators to ensure that a greater focus on those targets and, in particular, appropriate cleaning, especially on our trains, uh, to ensure that rail operators are delivering on what will become an increasingly important obligation in the weeks ahead to keep our public transport running for as long as we possibly can? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, the member will be aware of the very specific measures that ScotRail have taken forward in the course of the last year in terms of helping to improve the cleanliness of 
um, uh, rail uh, uh, of uh, trains within the franchise agreement. What I can also say to the member is that we are providing them with the most up-to-date clinical guidance that's been provided by Health Protection Scotland, um, who are managing this information for the Scottish Government. Uh, that's been shared with them, and we expect all operators within the transport sector to act upon the guidance that has been provided. Of course, we are having to look at contingency arrangements, uh, given the nature of the incident which we are dealing with, uh, and that will have an impact on our transport system, which is why we have asked all the operators to consider what contingency arrangements they can put in place and to make sure that they have appropriate uh, continuity plans in place uh, to try and manage uh, the situation as best we can. And what I can assure the member is it will continue to keep the parliament and uh, uh, the public as up to date as possible uh, should there be any changes to the existing arrangements which we have in place in order to make sure that we can continue to provide as much as resilient transport system as we can in what is uh, a very challenging situation. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. On Monday, in response to a question on testing for the coronavirus at airports, the UK Government Health Secretary stated, and I quote, the evidence from other countries that have tried temperature testing at airports shows that it is not effective and can actually be counterproductive to the effort because it leads to lots of false positives, unquote. Does the Scottish Government's scientific advice concur with this view? And is the Cabinet Secretary content with the approach being taken by Scotland's airports at present? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the information which has been provided by the Scottish Government to our airports is consistent with the messaging and information that's been provided to all airports across uh, the UK. Health Protection Scotland uh, has approved the advice uh, which has been issued to Scottish airports. Uh, we continue to update that in line uh, with the best scientific advice that we are being provided with. Uh, Transport Scotland officials are in regular contact with our airports, ensuring uh, that this information is being appropriately displayed uh, and provided within our airports. And our, our Scottish airports are continuing to take forward appropriate measures to deal with anyone uh, who they may have concerns about uh, and to provide them with medical support and advice at the airport itself. Uh, so I can assure the member uh, that we are using the most up-to-date uh, scientific advice uh, for our airports. But of course, given it is a fluid and fast-moving situation, that's continually reviewed and will be updated as appropriately. Question number two, Jimmy Halker johnson to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve travel connectivity to and within the Highlands and Islands. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government continues to invest in strategic transport uh, connections to and within the Highlands and Islands, which supports communities and businesses across the region. This includes over £370 million for enhancing key rail routes, commitments to improving bus connections and investing over £2 billion in Lifeline ferry services since 2007. We're also making good progress on our major road improvement commitments, uh, including the A9, A86 and A82 strategic road connections, and continued support for air services to Highland and Islands airports. Looking forward, the next Strategic Transport Projects Review is considering future investment priorities for the Strategic Transport Network. Jamie Halper johnson uh, Thank the Minister for that answer. In the budget statement, we heard much about proposals to investigate a free bus travel scheme for under-19s, if possible. Um, but can the Minister advise me if at any stage he's considered the impact of the policy on rural and island communities where bus links are often short in supply? And also in those island communities, what consideration has been given for including uh, inter-island ferries, which are so often used by people even for short uh, journeys, in such a scheme to allow young people in our islands to be able to travel as well? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, certainly, the, those are two important areas that uh, the member raises. Certainly, on the first, on rural and island communities, it's very much at uh, the heart of uh, colleague Michael Matheson, uh, his consideration of the development of the National Transport Strategy and the Strategic Transport Project Review to make sure we are thinking about the, the needs of our island communities and, and uh, rural communities more generally. I appreciate the point he makes. I, I know myself in rural areas that often uh, it's the, their bus services uh, are, are lacking in terms of particular directions and routes that obviously limit the choices for, for customers uh, to travel to work and, and for leisure. Uh, so that's something very much in the mind of government. We're looking at how we can support rural, uh, rural authorities. Uh, in terms of inter internal island ferries issues, certainly we can try and work more closely with island authorities about uh, trying to integrate uh, transport modes to, uh, as we will be doing with the supported ferry networks to try and make sure we're making the maximum use of our bus and rail connections to our ferries. Similarly, we can try and do that in working with uh, the island authorities to see how we can make the most of internal uh, bus connections with, with internal ferries and try and support uh, a more integrated transport model overall, but certainly willing to discuss the issue with Mr. Harker Johnson. Question number three, Jeremy Balfour. <coughs> uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government 
what assessment has made of the impact of a recent two-day closure of a Queensferry crossing? Cabinet Secretary Michael Marcus. Uh, no assessment has been made of this closure as the duration was for a short period. Jeremy Balfour. The two-day closure of the Queensferry crossing had a massive economic impact on Lothian, Fife and the rest of Scotland. Despite warnings, the Minister previously said the risk of ice forming is extremely rare. And now we are hearing the sensors will be installed on this major transport link in the coming months. Minister, do you think this is acceptable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Second officer, I, I think the member is uh, somewhat uh, uh, misled uh, or misinformed in terms of the risk of ice forming on uh, the Queensferry crossing. As the member will be aware, I don't know if he was able to attend the briefing, which technical briefing, uh, which was provided by the engineers, is that at the design stage it was identified as being extremely low risk. Uh, and at that stage, it was decided that it should be managed in an uh, operational basis in the way in which it is at the present uh, time. The incident which occurred last year, of course, uh, was one which led to very significant investigations into appropriate measures that could uh, manage the issue. And the outcome of that last October has been getting progressed and taken forward. And the member will be aware of the work that's now been undertaken in, in, in relation to that. Uh, although I, I do recognise and I, I very much regret the disruption that was caused by the closure of the bridge, um, it is not something uh, that is, uh, is common in, uh, in cable stay bridges uh, within the UK overall. Uh, there have been some incidents down south which have resulted in bridges being closed there as well um, uh, as a result, but it's not a common occurrence uh, within our climate overall. Uh, but clearly, uh, we will continue to consider what further measures can be taken forward to try and address the risk uh, if there are means by which it can be mitigated. But I should also point out to the member that since the Queensferry crossing has opened, there are now 55 occasions, 55 occasions when the fourth road bridge would have been restricted to high-sided vehicles, when the Queensferry crossing has had no restrictions in place now, I'm sure the member, as a fair-minded individual, would recognise that the Queensferry crossing is delivering a much more resilient crossing on the fourth than the fourth bridge did uh, during its period. Uh, and that's something that we should very much uh, welcome, uh, notwithstanding uh, the unfortunate incident which occurred um, a few months ago. But it's important to keep it within some context and recognise that the Queensferry crossing is proving to be a much more resilient uh, bridge in making sure that we continue to have that important link between Edinburgh and Fife. Question number four, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to further develop rail halts in areas where there's an identified need. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, recent Scottish Government investment has delivered a new station at Rob Royston, acting as an enabler for social and economic growth. Uh, construction is underway for a new station at Kintore, which is on schedule to be completed in May this year. We're also committed to delivering new stations at Reston and East Linton, and the Leavenmouth project will deliver new, fully accessible stations within Leaven and Cameron Bridge. Looking forward, the second strategic transport project review is currently underway to identify our strategic transport investment priorities, including any new railway stations for the next 20 years. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Wester Hill is an area of Bishop Briggs in my constituency which is earmarked for development under the Glasgow City Deal programme. A rail halt to service the many industries and surrounding housing development, developments would be an enormous benefit to the area. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that part of the £5 million in the budget to expand future rail options could be considered to fund a feasibility study in Wester Hill? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Signing officer, of the future rail interventions such as at uh, New Wester Hill Station uh, would require a positive transport appraisal to be undertaken in order to, uh, to take account of the potential impact that it could have on the wider rail network. Uh, responsibility for appraisals lies with the relevant sponsoring uh, promoter. Uh, for example, that could be a developer, uh, it could be one of the regional transport partners, or it could also be the local authority uh, to progress any proposal. Uh, therefore, if there is a, a view within the community and within uh, uh, my, uh, my colleague's uh, constituency that a rail halt at this particular point uh, would be worth uh, considering, uh, then it is a matter that could be taken forward uh, through the existing uh, arrangements and I would encourage a member uh, to engage with them and to seek, a, and to, seek to discuss whether there could be uh, a proposal brought forward. Mark Russell. 
Thank you. I'm delighted that last week Transport Scotland approved the case for change report for the Newborough rail halt. Um, can the Minister confirm that the £5 million for rail development work already, already mentioned um, will include an open application process um, to allow projects to continue through uh, their development of the pipeline over the next coming year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign office in relation to the £5 million that we have set for uh, looking at improving uh, Scotland's railways uh, and potentially for new stations, we'll set out further details in the coming weeks exactly how that scheme will operate and how it will be taken forward. Thank you. Question number five has been withdrawn. Question number six, Bill Bowman. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to ensure that the Port of Dundee is properly equipped to handle decommissioning work. Minister Paul Wheeler. <coughs> The Scottish Government supports Dundee's ambitions as a location for decommissioning and Dundee is well placed to compete for this work. The Scottish Government has provided support to projects in Dundee through the Decommissioning Challenge Fund, including an investment of over £500,000 in a permanently fixed heavy lift crane to facilitate the transfer of material to the quayside, generating cost and time efficiencies. The DCS fourth round launched in July 2019. A number of applications were received from Dundee-based organisations and the results from this round will be announced shortly. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you for that response. As the Minister will be aware, it was reported in the media recently that the contractor who was cleaning the FPSO from the Curlew field for Shell at the port of Dundee was unable to finish the job and it turns out that parts of the FPSO could not be cleaned without first being dismantled. However, Dundee does not have the necessary facilities. Now this is disappointing news. Was the Minister aware that Dundee does not have such facilities and therefore Shell had to terminate the decommissioning work in Dundee with the work now having to be completed elsewhere? And can you give some assurances that this will not happen again? Uh, Minister. Uh, but certainly on the point, yes, we were aware of the issue in relation to, to Dundee. Um, as I explained in my original answer, we are very supportive of Dundee's ambitions and we provided funding to successful decommissioning projects at the port of Dundee and the Tay area more generally. We are committed to ensuring that decommissioning in Scotland is executed in a safe, environmentally sound and cost-effective manner. It's not possible, unfortunately, for the Scottish Government uh, to dictate business decisions made by companies on how best to utilise its resources. We are aware of the particular technical reason why this uh, vessel is being uh, taken away uh, from Dundee for, for uh, splitting into compartments and then, and then uh, to be cleaned uh, elsewhere. Uh, but the Scottish Government has no say in the day-to-day -day running of any uh, commercial company such as the port. Uh, the port sector in Scotland is market driven and port authorities are responsible for determining which facilities they choose to invest in and what level of infrastructure to install to meet the demand for the market. But we have shown a hope in terms of the investment in the craneage at Dundee that were there good cases made that we have supported through the DCF and as I say uh, decisions are yet to be taken on the forthcoming round of the de uh, decommissioning challenge fund but hopefully that will not be long off. And question number seven, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for more investment in safety improvements for the A90 and whether these will include additional funding to improve the effectiveness of average speed cameras. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mannes. Uh, Transport Scotland is working with road safety partners to investigate a number of locations on the A90 which have been identified through the annual road safety screening process and engagement with local communities and uh, ele local elected members. Uh, this builds on the programmed road safety plan which includes the grade separation pro project at Lawrence Kirk. In addition, throughout 2020-2021, uh, this government will invest some £4.65 million in targeted safety camera activities as we strive to deliver uh, Scotland's road safety vision of a future where no one is killed and the injury rates are much reduced. Liam Kerr. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Perhaps unexpectedly, according to Police Scotland, the number of crashes and resulting deaths have actually increased since the cameras were installed and anyone familiar with the A90 knows the main issues are particularly at junctions and crossovers. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, other than uh, Lawrence Kirk, what new measures specifically at these junctions is the Scottish Government proposing to reduce those figures? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, to an officer, um, a, a note of caution for the member because the uh, statistics in an issue like this should be looked at over a three-year period and we have not completed that three-year period. Therefore, I think to jump to that conclusion would be misguided uh, and potentially uh, misleading uh, in terms of the impact that the average speed cameras have had because we only have to look at the experience we've had with average speed cameras on other major trunk road network and they have had a significantly positive impact 
uh, on uh, those roads and there is no reason why that should be any different on the A90. Therefore, uh, a note of caution for the member in rushing to judgment on these matters I think would be appropriate. Having said that, there are a range of areas which are presently uh, under investigation, uh, where there are investigation what's been undertaken in the A90, uh, potentially with uh, some of them programmed for actions uh, later this year. Some where further investigations are presently being undertaken to consider whether there are appropriate interventions, and there are other areas which are being considered for further assessment to determine whether there are a need for further interventions uh, going forward. So I can assure the member, uh, given the uh, very strong record that this government has got in investing in road infrastructure in the northeast of Scotland and in making sure that we continue to drive down the number of deaths and serious accidents that occur within our trunk road network, that we will continue to look at what are appropriate measures, not only in the A90, but right across our trunk road network, to ensure that we continue to drive driver improvement and road safety. Thank you very much and apologise to Mr Mason. I'm afraid we don't have enough time to get to question eight on the AWPR. I'll have to be content with a written answer to his very good question. However, that concludes portfolio questions on transport infrastructure and connectivity. And we're going to move on shortly to the next item, which is a stage one debate on motion 21200 in the name of Mary Goujon on the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Bill. I would invite all members who wish to contribute to this afternoon's stage one debate to press their request to speak buttons.